Hello and welcome. My name is Eitan Suez. This is the uh, CNCF on demand webinar about the Istio certification exam. Uh, let's uh, get started. My name is uh, Eitan Suez. I work at a company by the name of Tetrate. And uh, the title of this talk again is about the Istio certification exam, something that I was involved in, in helping uh, bring about. And so I'd like to give you an overview of that. So let's begin with uh, just a simple uh, question. I'm curious if you, if you knew, first of all, that Istio, of course, is uh, a, uh, an open source service mesh, uh, a project that was donated to the uh, CNCF. And um, it is today a graduated CNCF project. But did you know that not only is the Istio project a graduated CNCF project, but that the CNCF also now has a formal certification exam for Istio, and that's the subject of, of our talk. So that exam is called the Istio Certified Associate, abbreviated, or, or the acronym is the ICA. And personally to me, uh, taking the ICA exam is a natural next step in uh, one's certification journey. So if you for example, are already a Kubernetes professional and you maybe you're a developer and you've already certified and gotten the CCAD exam or, or a platform operator or administrator who took the CKA, uh, you might consider uh, as a next step looking at the service mesh uh, certification, specifically the Istio one ICA. All right, so what are we gonna do in this talk? We're gonna obviously, the focus is this ICA exam. We're gonna take a look at that exam. But the main objective is not to um, not to teach you Istio. There's uh, far too little time in the, in the span, uh, space that we have to do that, but rather to put the certification exam on your radar and to tell you enough about it for you to be educated enough to make a decision that that's something that you want to pursue and, and then how to go about preparing. This is really what we're going to cover. So it's not to teach you Istio, though we will cover the, the resources that you need to, uh, that you can uh, sort of uh, lean on to prepare. Uh, and so in that respect, this talk is more of a meta talk. It's about this certification exam. It's not going to teach you Istio. All right, so what are we going to discuss more specifically? We're going to start with uh, a little bit of the background history and answer the question, how did this exam uh, sort of come to be, come about? Uh, it was contributed to the CNCF by um, my uh, employer, by Tetrate. Uh, and uh, and I'm going to start by uh, asking a fairly high level uh, question, but I think an important one to pose is, is on the merits of certifications in general. Uh, and uh, from there, we're going to go straight into uh, looking at the general information about the exam itself. And, and then we'll proceed to look at uh, what are some of the logistics that you need to be aware of and some of the information, again, about the exam. And then we we delve into the exact topics, the domains and competencies, as it's called, that are covered in the exam. So you know exactly what topics, uh, what domains are, are essentially uh, things that you will encounter when you take the exam, how to prepare for the exam. We'll talk about the exam environment itself, what it looks like. Um, and, uh, and then uh, I'll, I've assembled a list of learning resources that I'm going to go over with you so that you know essentially where to go to um, to prepare or maybe uh, give you a strategy for for learning Istio and preparing for the exam. Uh, and, and that involves breaking down the Istio reference documentation website. And I will close with uh, some tips and strategies for acing the exam. All right, so let's begin with the background and history. Um, the uh, announcement of this certification, it was a fairly recent recent thing. It happened, uh, I think, in uh, late September, but the exam wasn't available until November. And you can uh, look at some of the blogs that were sort of published uh, to announce the Istio Certified Associate exam. This was the Linux Foundation's blog, and uh, my company, Tetrate, likewise also blogged about uh, our contribution of the certification exam to the CNCF. Um, and I will, I'll make sure to share all of these links with you, um, as well. Uh, so there was an announcement, but how did it come to be? What's interesting is that, uh, it started long before it started a couple of years before, uh, Tetrate itself being a service mesh company, having vested interest and contrib making uh, active contributions to open source projects on the CNCF, including Envoy and Istio. Um, 
dedicated itself to uh, to producing a certification exam. It was originally called the CIAT, which stood for the uh, Certified Istio Administrator by Tetrate. Uh, and uh, essentially, uh, a number of events took place in the sort of natural evolution of, of the project. Uh, I remember vividly, it was, I think, in IstioCon 2022, when I think it was Google or Eric Brewer that announced... Uh, that the project would be donated to the uh, CNCF and uh, and it took uh, several months or maybe a year until uh, the project itself actually graduated. And so at that point, it became clear that, you know, if Istio itself is going to be a graduated CNCF project, it only made sense for the, uh, there to exist a certification exam for Istio that also was sort of an industry standard. And so we, by we, I mean my company and myself, uh, initiated talks with, uh, with the, the Linux Foundation to contribute the exam. And we went through a review process uh, where the members of the Istio project committee were involved and they reviewed the exam and uh, made uh, suggestions, uh, feedback. They wanted to see certain changes. And we went through a few cycles of essentially uh, making changes and uh, improvements until uh, we reached a steady state and the exam was ready to sort of um, ready to go. Uh, so this culminated in the exam going live in, in November of 2023. So here we are just a couple of months later, but uh, we I've never really had a chance to really uh, sit down and properly uh, give you a complete sort of overview of, uh, of the exam. So here, here we are. And, uh, and uh, this is actually uh, quite timely because, uh, you know, KubeCon EU is just around the corner. It's just maybe a week or so away. And so uh, I think this is a good time to, to do that. So let's begin at, the, at a very high level with uh, a general question on the merits of certification exams, because that's, that seems to be something that uh, we have a, a variety of opinions about. Right? A lot of different people have different things to say about, about these things, that maybe they're superfluous or maybe they're not representative of uh, sort of the challenges of, of uh, a role of a software engineer in a particular context or or what have you. And that perhaps I think was more true uh, several years ago um, before sort of the advent of this sort of performance-based exam, which uh, I think became rather clear with, with Kubernetes. So as Kubernetes sort of uh, came to be and uh, one of the sort of ancillary efforts with, with the technology was the creation of a certification exam that was taken very seriously and it was designed to be performance-based. And by performance-based, what we mean is essentially uh, you're presented with challenges that you have to solve in a particular um, amount of time, which is much more representative of, of the types of things you would do in, in, in your role as a software engineer. And so uh, it, uh, it worked better and it became, a, we all know that it was quite successful. The certification exams was, uh, was something that a large number of uh, members of the uh, sort of uh, tech community decided to approach and to challenge themselves and take and and it had beneficial side effects which i i love right it was effective and in, in almost building community around the popular open source technology uh, everyone it felt uh, in, maybe inclusive everyone felt that they were sort of gone through the same sort of pains to uh, achieve uh, certification we know there are a number of different types uh, there's the cka and ccad and cks and there are others besides uh, and so uh, it also maybe served to break down certain silos between organizations or what have you, which, which was a good thing. Um, we can think of certification also as a forcing function to learning new technology. Now, this can be taken perhaps a little bit too far, but I like the idea in general. Uh, so we, we don't want to go so far as to get to what I like to call an anti-pattern, right? This where uh, we might uh, consider taking a certification exam for the sake of getting that badge. Uh, sometimes that can be luring, but uh, it's got to be, of course, relevant to the work that we do. Um, and, um, and the other thing to say is that maybe we shouldn't start with certification, right? Certification is more of a rubber stamp after the fact, right? So assuming we've had in our job, in our role, opportunities to build practical experience with the technology, uh, it might be a natural next step to opt to proceed and take a certification exam. So that, to me, is a, sort of the right approach. Uh, you want to sort of lean on your experience uh, rather than, uh, you know, try to cram and, and, and treat this like uh, maybe a final exam in, in college or what have you or in school. Um, all right, so let's uh, let's take a look at this Istio Certified Associate uh, and ask answer some questions about it. Who is it for? What is the exam format? We can go and actually visit the landing page. There it is, Istio Certified Associate. 
the ICA, there's that badge, you can see all kinds of information about it, but the, the, what really jumps out at you at first is are these three boxes here which try to answer some of the main questions that someone might have when they're first looking at, at this landing page. Who is this exam for? What is this certification about? And uh, what does it demonstrate? And, and the answers there are that the ICA is a certification designed for engineers, so that's a very very broad statement, right? It doesn't specify what type of engineers. CICD practitioners, so I like that, practitioners, but I'm not sure exactly what. To me, CICD and automation are sort of obviously, obviously very important things, but maybe orthogonal to the concepts of service mesh. Uh, or anyone with special interest in STO. So that's that's a good catch-all phrase. I like that very much. And there are many reasons why you might have special interest in STO as a developer, as a platform operator, as someone on an engineering team who wants to maybe solve a, uh, a real problem in the organization. Uh, about the exam, the ICA will confirm foundational knowledge of Istio principles, terminology, best practices, and demonstrate ability to set up and configure Istio. Uh, so that's all very, very good. Uh, the uh, What it demonstrates is what uh, every certification exam, in my mind, demonstrates that's a solid understanding of the principles of the technology in question. In this case, it's, it's Istio. And, uh, and that's all well and good. Um, and there's more information uh, here. The domains and competencies are listed. We'll take a cl very close look at that in a moment. And there's some documents here that are very important to sort of peruse and read through, uh, such as FAQ, or the Candidate Handbook, which answer a variety of questions, which we'll get to in, in, in turn. Uh, so I mentioned the uh, exam is a performance-based exam. That means it's hands-on. It's not the multiple choice uh, uh, exam, you're actually challenged. You have to solve very specific problems. You're given tasks that you have to sort of implement. Uh, you might have troubleshooting questions as well. Uh, it's very similar in that sense to uh, the Kubernetes certifications. Okay, so the uh, it's interesting to also point out that it's a sort of collection of cloud native certifications is is emerging. Uh, and I like to think of the Kubernetes certifications as, as being sort of a foundation because many of these cloud native technologies build on Kubernetes. So you, you just see the landing page here for the cloud native certifications includes the CKA, the CCAD and so on. But there you'll see the, for example, if you're uh, specializing in observability, uh, Prometheus Certified Associate is, a, is another certification that you can take. The Istio Certified Associate is mentioned here and there are additional ones. And I suspect that this list will grow over time. And so uh, I guess the only comment I have, to, I have in that regard is the fact that there, there is sort of a specialization then from Kubernetes to, to something else, like for example, Prometheus, uh, in terms of a certification track. Uh, and as far as um, the ICA itself, along sort of that, that sort of branch of evolution, which I'm imagining in, in my head right now, uh, the ICA is, you know, Istio I consider as an extension of Kubernetes, and so it sort of makes sense to, to sort of do things in, in that order, right? Get a Kubernetes uh, certification first and the Istio one subsequently. Now, if we look uh, at this page, there is a section on prerequisites uh, somewhere down here. There we are, prerequisites. And I was a little surprised when I first noticed that it said uh, no prerequisites for this exam, and that basically means uh, I suspect that you don't really need to have, say, the CCAD or any of the Kubernetes certifications in order to present yourself for, for this certification exam. But you should know that Istio obviously is an extension of Kubernetes, that you're going to use kubectl plenty, so to speak, as you take the exam. And so uh, an understanding of Kubernetes, the knowledge of Kubernetes and how to use that platform is indeed a prerequisite to, uh, to working with Istio. And so that maybe goes without say, but I, I like to be explicit when I can. All right, so a little bit of uh, sort of information about this, uh, this exam. It's a two hour duration examination. It costs uh, $250. Uh, how to enroll is rather, rather simple. There's re a really big button here that you, know, you can sort of essentially uh, drill down into and uh, fill out the form. You need to obviously have a Linux Foundation profile um, and, um, and off you go, right? And just, uh, pay for the, for the exam. And what, what does that give you? That gives you a time window of 12 months in which you can schedule and take the exam. A passing score is a 75%, uh, which, uh, you know, I'd like to compare that to something else I know about. I recall when I took the CCAD exam, I'm sure it's changed by now, but uh, 
back in the day, it was, uh, I think, a 66% with the passing score. Sort of, you know, two out of three questions right got you the certificate. Here, it seems like a slightly higher hurdle, three out of four. So it's something to be mindful of. Uh, but the saving grace there, of course, is like many other certification exams, you get a free retake if you don't pass it on the first try. Uh, it's definitely challenging. Um, and uh, so I, you know, as I personally recommend that you take the, the, the challenge very seriously, you study for it and uh, try as much as possible to be so ready that uh, there's no doubt that you'll pass it uh, on the first try. All right, many of these details you'll find on the FAQ, which I mentioned is uh, at the bottom of this page. There's a uh, an ICA frequently asked question link that you can uh, sort of uh, click on and uh, it will take you to, to the document that answers a variety of questions, uh, including uh, the ones, the answers uh, to which are listed here on this page. Uh, so let's move over to really the meat of it, which is, uh, you know, what domains and competencies are you tested on? Right, and uh, if, you, if you're already familiar with Service Mesh, which you should be, if you're considering taking the exam, you should have some, some uh, practical experience, not with everything, but at least with some parts of, of, uh, of Istio, uh, are uh, these five main sections, installation, upgrade and configuration, traffic management, resilience and fault injection, security, and uh, advanced scenarios. Uh, and it's interesting to see the breakdown. Uh, it's not surprising, actually. Traffic management is definitely one of those sort of major capabilities associated with service mesh. One of the main things we unlock, the ability to do canary upgrades of, of our applications is simplified through uh, the traffic management capabilities in, in service mesh and Istio. Uh, but there is, uh, you know, it's a single exam. It's not like we don't have like, a, you know, an Istio administrator, Istio developer, but you should know that Istio is a platform Harm has many associated personas, right? There are developers who deploy their workloads to the mesh, and there are operators who install and configure and manage the uh, the platform, and that includes Istio and the mesh, and they monitor the mesh, and the developers monitor their apps running on the mesh. Uh, so there are definitely multiple roles or security professionals involved, but there's a single exam, and so that exam is going to include um, all facets of all three, right? There is uh, administration, installation, and upgrade. Uh, which is more of an operator task. There's uh, traffic management, which might be uh, primarily a developer task, but not exclusively so. And, you know, securing workloads may be something a security professional might have more interest in. Um, so, so it's all there. Um, let's talk about the uh, how this all breaks down. Uh, now, before we, we get there, uh, you, uh, you may be asking the question, you know, what about the Kubernetes Gateway API? Uh, so if you're following the technology, you know what the Kubernetes Gateway API is. The Kubernetes, it's, it's essentially an effort to create a uh, sort of a new specification for configuring ingress, which might maybe ultimately be sort of the one to rule them all, so to speak, uh, maybe a unify a de facto standard across multiple technologies on how to configure ingress routing and other facets of traffic management. So you see here the main uh, custom resources involved in the Kubernetes Gateway API. And the reason I mentioned that is, of course, Istio today supports both its sort of original configuration of gateways and, and, uh, and routing through a virtual service and destination rule, uh, whereas, but it also supports this new Gateway API. So the question is, is it actually going to be on the exam? And is ambient mesh going to be covered? Right, that's another good question. Um, and the answer is not in the current version of the exam. So the current version of the exam it covers what I like to think of as sort of the traditional Istio, you know, the sidecar-based approach with the, uh, the original uh, APIs and custom resources, which are by no means deprecated. Uh, they are going to continue to be supported for a very long time to come. But it's inevitable that ultimately uh, those features will be added to the certification exam in the future. I personally am not involved in the uh, sort of future planning of, uh, of, of how the, uh, the exam will evolve. And so I cannot give you a concrete date and when this actually will happen. But of course, it'll have to happen in lockstep with the maturation of, of, of these new features and maybe others besides. Right, so let's talk about this. Uh, the first uh, domain or competency is to installation, upgrade, and configuration. Under each one, uh, as uh, you know, if you look uh, on again back on this page, you can expand all of these. And I want to take a closer look at each of the specific items mentioned under each category. 
So um, the first one we're told uh, using the Istio CLI to install a basic cluster. And so that's definitely something you should know. If something is cited explicitly, you can uh, sort of bet that it's going to be on the exam. But that's not, the converse is not necessarily true, right? There may be things on the exam which are not mentioned explicitly in this little sort of brief list of things you should know how to do. Uh, so uh, if we think about installation with Istio, you can install Istio on Kubernetes with the Istio Cuddle CLI, you can also do so with Helm. And so you should know how to do it both ways. And you should know also how to upgrade, right? Uh, not just uh, not just install. Uh, we're told more specifically, customizing the Istio installation with the Istio operator API. And so that's important. And that can get, you know, if you're not familiar with that process, a little overwhelming in that there's a lot uh, of different things that can be configured. So uh, you should definitely familiarize yourself with the concept of this Istio operator API. That's the custom resource uh, it has nothing to do with the operator per se. There is no operator involved, but it's the custom resource that defines exactly the, the mesh configuration and all of the components of Istio that you wish to install and what you want to configure. Maybe you don't want to include an egress gateway, only an ingress gateway, or things of that nature, or customize the resource requests or resource limits uh, that maybe the uh, Istio control plane is, is going to be uh, configured with. So those are the things you need to know. Uh, that third bullet item seems to me almost like a, maybe a slight repetition using overlays to manage Istio component settings. You still do that with Istio operator API. So you need to know how to do that. You, know, you may be asked something along the lines of install Istio on this Kubernetes cluster uh, using a particular profile, uh, but uh, with some exceptions. And so you need to know how to uh, craft a, uh, a manifest that will define exactly the configuration you're asked to produce and then apply that as you install your, your Kubernetes cluster, uh, your, your Istio uh, service mesh on top of your Kubernetes cluster. All right, so I mentioned already that traffic management is really the uh, sort of the, uh, the largest fraction in terms of weight that, uh, you, you know, you're the majority of questions, well, not majority, but uh, 40% of the questions are going to pertain to traffic management. And that's going to include, of course, first and foremost, controlling network traffic flows within the service mesh. You need to know how to do that. How do you configure routing uh, uh, to uh, particular maybe versions of, of services on specific conditions? Maybe there are header matches, uh, things of that nature. You need to be familiar with all of that. That's, that's really sort of front and center for Istio. Uh, you need to know, and that perhaps goes without say, how do you configure sidecar injection? Uh, but when you think about that problem, uh, there's, there's multiple parts to it, right? There's manual uh, uh, sidecar injection. You need to know how that works. The Istio Cuddle Cube Inject command, for example, and then automated sidecar injection. And within that uh, sort of area, there are different ways of doing that, right? You can define it at the namespace level. You need to know those conventions, but you may also need to be familiar with how do you configure a single workload to specify that it wants a sidecar injected. Uh, there are specific labels that can be performed at the resolution of a single workload, so you need to know that as well. Uh, using the gateway resource to configure ingress and egress traffic. So, of course, uh, configuring ingress and egress is part of traffic management, so you definitely need to know that. And there's lots of sort of different knobs that you can configure uh, when you configure a gateway, what protocol, what ports, uh, and other concerns. Uh, understanding how to use a service entry resource for adding entries to the service registry. Uh, and that... Uh, I, you know, what comes to mind, uh, there are multiple different use cases there, but one that's uh, sort of front and center in my mind is when you define egress traffic, you typically are also identifying uh, some mesh external service through service entry. So you need to, to know how that works. Uh, need to define uh, how to define traffic policies using a destination rule. So destination rules are, again, one of the primary uh, custom resources that Istio provides for defining traffic policy, load balancing algorithms. Uh, and other facets of traffic policy can be configured through that resource. So you need to familiarize yourself with that. Uh, and there's also never, uh, <laughs> there's never an end to the list of, of things you need to know. Traffic mirroring is another facet of traffic management. So you need to know how that works as well. All right. So somewhat related to traffic management is resilience and fault injection. You know, those are things such as uh, configuring circuit breakers. Uh, and so you need to familiarize yourself with how that works. Uh, there are different ways of, you know, you can configure it with or without the concept of outlier detection, this idea of quarantining a workload when, when it errors for a period of time, there's an ejection time and things. So you need to familiarize yourself with that. How do you configure that? And other resilience features besides, maybe simpler things like retries and timeouts. And, um, and I'm sure that list is not uh, a, a 
exhaustive. So, so definitely look at the resilience section in the documentation. Part of resilience is testing your, your system under different adverse conditions, such as when there are errors or faults, and you can inject faults with uh, by programming those sidecars through Istio. And so you need to familiarize yourself with how you configure fault injection, and that includes not just faults, but also delays um, in uh, specific resources. So these sidecars can be programmed to introduce a, an artificial delay for the sake of testing if the whole system, uh, sort of how it behaves uh, under adverse conditions. Uh, security, of course, is a big topic. Uh, that's a very important facet of service mesh, perhaps the most important ones. A lot of enterprises are adopting service mesh primarily for, for security, for zero trust. So you need to understand the concepts and also how to apply them. So uh, what you need to know under that uh, sort of topic is uh, many of the Istio security features. What comes to mind front and center is workload identity, right? Peer authentication, but there's also request authentication, user identity. And on top of those authentication mechanisms are authorization policies. You need to know how to configure authorization policies for traffic, HTTP or TCP traffic. You need to know how to configure mutual TLS uh, in your mesh or and at different uh, scopes of resolution. And that's another thing that uh, maybe that so far we haven't mentioned this con uh, concept in Istio, many of the things you configure, many of these policies, whether they're traffic policies or security policies, um, can be applied uh, mesh wide. They can be applied only within a namespace, or you can use the concept of a workload selector to actually define uh, the scope of application of that policy. And so you need to familiarize yourself with the concept of workload selector. It, it, it features in multiple places. And then finally, advanced scenarios is uh, essentially uh, a variety of niche topics, such as the one uh, shown here, how to onboard non-Kubernetes workloads on to the mesh. You need to be familiar with, with what that's all about. You need to be familiar with the workload entry and workload group resource and, and other aspects of, of this procedure. Although I suspect that in two hours, uh, and given that this is 13% of um, the weight uh, for the exam uh, that uh, actually onboarding a VM is probably, you can safely think, is going to be out of scope. But you need to also, you may be asked task uh, that is a subset of the full, uh, of the full challenge. So, so do not ignore that. Uh, and then uh, I think the, the one that comes to mind most uh, importantly about under advanced scenarios are situations where you have to troubleshoot something that's not working properly. So imagine a, a scenario where you're told that in some namespace there may be some workloads that are supposed to be running, that are not running, or maybe they're running correctly, but something is wrong and you have to sort of find out why. So that, that means you, you need to understand uh, how do you diagnose, how do you inspect, how do you interrogate a system uh, using the kubectl CLI and the Istio CLI CLI to determine the current state of the system and then to get to the bottom of the issue and then figure out how to resolve the issue ultimately. All right, let's turn our attention to how to prepare. Um, now this... Uh, when when I drafted this, I asked myself the question: uh, Is is that too obvious? Uh, you know, I guess we each have a, you know a particular strategy, and none of them are wrong. Uh, this is just a suggestion; it's not something you should do. Uh, in my mind, I would begin by, um, of course, uh, using the topics that we just uh, looked at as sort of a list, a laundry list of things that we need to know, right? And so we need we can use that as a uh, a way of baselining our competency, identifying which areas we're fairly comfortable with or familiar with, which areas uh, where there may be gaps where we don't know much about that area, and, and then to proceed to methodically, methodically learn each, each topic or each domain. And that implies visiting every topic in the documentation and making sure we understand the concepts, but also build experience with each. And that means working through how-tos, right? Specific tasks in the documentation will help you with that. Uh, and again, I like to stress, don't just read do explorations, proactive exploration. So you stand up a cluster, you install Istio, you install Istio in different ways, figure out you know, uh, the different uh, commands of the Istio CLI uh, that might support uh, you know, uh, maybe uh, generating a manifest on, on your behalf, perhaps things of that nature. Uh, be familiarize yourself with the contents of the Istio distribution. There's a lot of things you can do there. Uh, and then finally, interact with the community. Uh, that you know, studying Istio also means getting on the uh, Slack channel and asking questions there and getting to know people, and that's, that's equally important. All right, about the exam environment. You know, imagine uh, you know, besides you know the the parts that are more administrative, such as you know, signing up, scheduling, 
showing up, uh, getting a good night's sleep be, uh, the night before, and and going through the whole proctoring process. Uh, you know, the number of rules you can't have. You can't have much information on your desk. Uh, you need to show the proctor that you have essentially a clean working area uh, to ensure that you're doing this fair and square. Uh, but once you're given access to the environment, what your sort of um, encounter there is essentially an operating system, a virtual machine that you're accessing through probably through a web browser. Uh, it's going to be an Ubuntu operating system, so be familiar with Linux. And um, kubectl and Istio Cuddle are going to be pre-installed. Uh, there will be on the file system a copy of the Istio distribution. Currently, the current version of the exam is running Istio version 118, which is not too dated. I think that was released in the fall of 2023. Uh, and uh, you're given a choice of two editors, primarily Vim and VS Code. So you pick your poison there in terms of which one you prefer. And uh, you are instructed for each challenge to perform your work in a specific Kubernetes context. And so that's important. You need to be aware you know, uh, that you uh, select the right context before you begin your work. I mean, if you make an error there, that could be rather costly, right? Because the, the solution will not be in the correct environment. All right, a very important point, it's an open book exam, just like the Kubernetes certifications. That means you have access to the Istio reference documentation while you're taking the exam. And that's crucial. That makes, uh, there are a number of implications from uh, this decision. Um, it means you don't have to memorize all that YAML, and I don't think you should ever have to memorize that YAML. But that means it also means that you should be familiar with the different custom resources, know which custom resource you need to apply, uh, generally have an understanding of the types of things you can configure with each custom resource. Those things are things you should know in advance, become familiar with, and get uh, really comfortable with that. It means you need to know where to find information and how to quickly look that up. Because again, remember, on, in two hours, you may be confronted with, I don't know exactly how many challenges, but I'm sure it's going to be testing your ability to complete all the challenges in a limited amount of time. All right, let's turn our attention to learning resources. I'm going to uh, close a couple of these tabs, if you don't mind. And uh, first and foremost, uh, the Istio reference documentation. It should be your main reference for preparing, and everything you need to know should be there. This is the Istio reference documentation. We'll, we'll go through it in detail. Uh, in, in just a little bit. Uh, in addition to the Istio reference uh, documentation, a good way to start may be with Istio Fundamentals, which is a course that we offer, we by we, I mean Tetrate on our Academy portal. On Tetrate Academy, you will find uh, this Istio Fundamentals course. Uh, it's a great course. It's by no means uh, the only resource you should consult if you want to pass the certification exam, but it's a great way to sort of ramp up. Uh, and then there are workshops that we, uh, we publish. So the Istio Zero, the 60 workshop is a popular one. Here is the sort of the, the, the landing page and what it looks like and a variety of, of labs such as installing Istio, learning about sidecar injection, service discovery, and uh, deploying applications to your mesh, configuring ingress, and so on. So a lot, lot of good stuff in there as well. Uh, and that workshop is also available in, in an environment called Killer Coda. If you're familiar with Killer Coda, the advantage there is you don't have to stand up your own Kubernetes cluster in order to, uh, to start playing with the technology. It's all sort of built in behind the scenes in the browser. Here you can see this Istio 0 to 60 workshop is essentially being provisioned in real time for me uh, uh, in, um, in my browser. And so I just follow through the instructions and I can... Uh, run commands and, and this is my shell and I can do work in here. This is great. Um, what else? Uh, there's also a recording of uh, myself and a colleague running through the Istio 060 workshop on Tetrate Academy. And so uh, you can essentially go there and go to the on-demand workshop section and under there you will find a recording of uh, running through the entire workshop. So that's, uh, that's also uh, a resource that I recommend. Uh, and there are more learning resources. There is a Linux Foundation course on edX. It's called Introduction to Istio. Uh, it looks something like this. And uh, this is substantial. There's a lot uh, that this course covers. As you can see here, it actually is estimated as a 10-week self-paced course. It's free, and so I highly recommend it. This is, again, something that myself and, and, and my colleague Peter um, uh, Sort of put together a little over a year ago, but uh, still very relevant for the certification exam. 
Uh, there is, of course, the book. I like to think of multiple different media, different ways of, of learning. So if you prefer books, uh, the Istio in Action book from Manning by Christian Pasta is, uh, is definitely an excellent one. It's, uh, again, you know, books uh, uh, don't, uh, don't get updated as often as maybe digital media, but it's still a, a very good one in my opinion. Uh, and, uh, and there's plenty of, of content uh, in video format on YouTube. For example, uh, Tetrate has published in the past a couple of series, one called Istio Weekly. The Tetrate Tech Talks is another one. Those are YouTube playlists that you can visit uh, just to give you a little flavor of what they look like. Uh, here's the, uh, the Tech Talks and the different episodes that took place largely in 2022, but still largely relevant uh, on, on Istio and other topics. So not all these episodes apply, but, um, but many of them uh, might actually help you. Uh, and the same goes for the Istio Weekly playlist that you see here a variety of episodes that you can uh, that center on Istio that you can sort of uh, review on your own time all right uh the one that i like to call out which i think is the most important because it's an open book exam and this is the website you will have access to while you're taking the exam and so the Istio documentation website uh let's break it down let's cover how the content is organized where to find information how to navigate the site uh, where to find examples that can serve as templates or starting points for a challenge on the exam. Um, and then how to look up the reference information for a custom resource, right? If you want to find out what the name of a particular field is, that's very important. You need to be able to, to look that up very quickly and use it as a reference uh, for uh, configuring maybe the installation of Istio and other, other such matters. So let's let's jump over here real quick. And I, again, many of these are you know, self-explanatory, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. Obviously, there's a section on concepts here, which explain the, uh, talk about the different facets of service mesh that uh, you know in, in terms of observability, security, extensibility, and traffic management. Um, it's interesting the play between reading, which is a passive activity largely, and exploring, which is an active activity. Uh, but they 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 complement one another. Oftentimes, you start with the concepts. But then you put it on hold and then you try something out and then you go back to the concepts and, and lo and behold, something starts to make more sense now because you have some, some practical experience with it as well. So the practical tasks you'll find under setup and under tasks. Now setup scopes, it's, uh, sort of its jurisdiction is really the installation. There's a getting started lab. That's probably where you want to start if you've never really played with Istio before. Uh, how do you install Istio on different Kubernetes clusters? So there are different recipes here for a variety of different target Kubernetes clusters. And, um, and you can see here also installation related topics and upgrade related topics. So installing with the Istio CLI, installing with Helm, installing multi-cluster, that's probably something that's out of scope for the certification exam. Uh, so uh, that's where you'll find a lot of that information and then upgrades. Canary upgrades versus in-place upgrades. You should understand the difference and uh, and know how to perform each one. And there are additional guides here. Uh, a lot of information is buried under this site, so you need to take spend time with it. Now, uh, many of the how-tos are um, are performed in the context of uh, a deployed application. So the sample, the canonical sample application for Istio is oftentimes is one called Book Info here. So it's worthwhile spending some time to familiarize yourself with this book info application. It's a polyglot, you know, set of four microservices. And uh, and then the tasks section is where you'll find a variety, quite a variety of how-tos in each category. So how do you route requests? Uh, how do you do fault injection? We talked about in traffic mirroring, circuit breaking. It's all there for you to sort of spend time with and discover. So definitely, uh, work through as many of these how-tos uh, that are correspond to the list uh, from, from the, uh, the list of domains and competencies listed on the exam. Uh, there are other concepts. Uh, ingress, of course, and egress are very important ones, and uh, you should cover those as well. There are different configuration modes, right? Ingress gateways with uh, secure gateways or insecure gateways, depending, you know, different protocols, TLS or mutual TLS. Uh, familiarize yourself with that. And egress is also equally important. You can bet that both will be included on the exam. And then uh, again, there are tasks that you can perform that pertain to security. So those will all be under each uh, corresponding section. Uh, and then finally, uh, under here, there are two more sections. One is an operations, uh, a section related, uh, dedicated specifically to different types of operations tasks. And so, and this is a, not necessarily how-tos, they could be more conceptual like the architecture 
uh, article here. And then at the very bottom is the reference. So if you want to learn how to configure things and, and different types of custom resources, for example, a destination rule, you'll find it here. But my main advice is while you're taking the exam and you're maybe instructed to uh, create a destination rule or what have you, um, the easiest way to get to that resource is through the search bar. And you, you'll, I mean, the easiest, the fastest way, right? So for example, if you're told create a virtual service, the first thing you want to do is maybe go and visit the virtual service reference page. And it's typically the, you know, the first result in the search results. And, uh, and as you should know the format, how these pages are organized, typically there's going to be a description of the resource and what it's responsible for, the types of things you can configure. And then it's followed by examples. But below the examples, then you'll have a full uh, description of all of the fields that make up that custom resource. And that's sort of a you know, nested data structure. So you need to be familiar with how to sort of navigate that as well, uh, how to configure the different fields, you know, the HTTP listeners uh, or HTTP routes in this case, right? I'm looking at a virtual service, not, not a gateway. Uh, and then you can also navigate through that through, um, through, through the uh, sort of little outline here, table of contents on the right-hand side. So if you want to configure retries, here's an example. If you're told in the exam that you need to configure retries, this might be a good starting point. You can click on this sort of copy, uh, hover over here and click on copy, and then you'll be able to paste that into maybe a file in your text editor and, and then make the appropriate modifications uh, as stipulated by the, the task uh, in question that you're sort of confronting while you're taking the exam. All right, uh, let's talk about some tips and test taking strategies. So, uh, and these seem, uh, uh, how you would say that, uh, these seem like uh, they're, uh, it goes without say that you should pay attention to the instructions, but that's, uh, I, I say this from my own personal experience. I sometimes overlook a detail or something I'm supposed to do and then that lands me in hot water. So it's easy to make a mistake. That's the point I'm trying to make here. Uh, it's not a bad thing to reread the instructions, maybe, uh, and not just at the beginning, maybe after you complete the, the challenge to make sure that you've actually done it right. Uh, practice. Practice is really the, to me, uh, the, the oil that, that lubricates, that makes everything work, right? You'll get better at things. Things will become second nature. You will have internalized certain concepts and you won't have to, you won't be struggling as much, especially when you're taking the exam. It's, you know, the when you want to enter the exam at a point where you're, you're already familiar with these concepts and as you identify what you're asked to do, your, autom your mind automatically maps it to something you've done before and you know exactly where to go to find your sort of starting point and know exactly how to proceed. So practice is very important. You'll get better and faster over time. Uh, look for ways of doing things that take less time. So over time, you want to get better and faster. Again, the reason I say faster, again, this is one of those contrived things in the certification exam that maybe on the job, you know, you're not under time pressure, but uh, while you're taking the exam, you definitely are. And so you want to look for ways of doing things expediently and ways of doing things that reduce the chances of making mistakes. For example, leveraging command completion to uh, avoid making a typo when you're entering the name of a flag, for example, or you think you remembered the name of the flag correctly, but it, it wasn't so, and the command completion can actually tell you what the actual spelling of that particular flag name is. So that's that's really important. Um, there's a gotchas category here. Well, uh, you know, obviously I mentioned time pressure. It's a race against the clock. You know, if the more challenge, the, the faster you go, obviously you don't want to go too fast. You want to check your work. Uh, but uh, that means the more time you have left over to go back and review the work that you've done, right? And to make sure you didn't make a mistake somewhere. Uh, so have a strategy. Obviously the, the one big thing that we typically call out for any certification exam is don't spend too much time on any one question. You should know in advance. They probably says in the handbook how many roughly how many questions or challenges you'll, you'll be faced with. And so you can maybe make a calculation of how much time you want to dedicate to each challenge uh, and, and be mindful of how much time you've spent. So if you're for some reason taking a, long, a wrong turn and uh, you find yourself stuck, maybe put that challenge on hold and go to the next one. That's not a bad uh, thing to do. Avoid careless mistakes. And uh, the way to do that is to have a checklist, almost like, uh, you know, pilots have to make sure that they followed all the procedure that they didn't forget to, you know, switch some crucial uh, knob or something uh, before they take off. So a checklist is good. Uh, a recipe, an algorithm, that's just an, another term for the same thing. Uh, review each question. Check that all tasks were performed. That's happened to me more than once. I've, uh, you know, sort of, ah, I know this question. I start working on it, but I didn't realize there was a second part to it that I completely ignored. And so I got 50% credit, for example. Uh, 
You don't want that to happen to you. Check you didn't overlook anything, that you didn't misspell something. If you're told to create a resource named XYZ123, make sure it's named that and that there are no mis, uh, things that are misspelled. Uh, the grading is probably going to look for the resource by that name, and if it doesn't find one, you might actually not get any points. That's not good. Um, make sure that you dig your work against the right Kubernetes context or in the right namespace. That could be really costly, right? If you... Um, if you did all of this work in the wrong namespace and then you get zero points for it, that uh, you don't want that to happen. Nobody likes that situation. Uh, a little bit more advice, uh, and this is a good good news, is you get partial grading, right? So imagine a task, for example, that asks you to create a uh, some kind of a custom resource to configure routing in your mesh, right? Or maybe a virtual service. Come back over here. Maybe we'll look at one of these. Maybe we have to configure multiple things, like retries and timeouts or, or so or, uh, well, the good news here is when uh, when you submit this resource, when you apply to your Kubernetes cluster, there are multiple things that uh, sort of the uh, the system is going to check for that you created the resource, that you configured retries, and then that you configured the right number of attempts, perhaps, or the right that you referenced the right subset. And each one of those has a weight, right? So if you got five of these seven things uh, correct, you're going to get partial credit. You're going to get five out of seven. You're not going to get zero. And that's that's the good thing to know about. So again, you want to make sure that you've answered all the questions, that you've sort of filled in the blanks correctly, uh, everything is uh, is accounted for, and then you'll get the full credit. Uh, and then, um, again, this is another thing that maybe goes without say, but know your environment, your working environment. This is going to be an Ubuntu machine. Be comfortable with your editor. Be comfortable with the, uh, the Bash shell. Be comfortable with KubeCuddle, with Istio Cuddle. Istio Cuddle specifically has lots of different, uh, it's like a Swiss army knife, lots of different commands, and some of them that maybe you don't need to use, but if you're aware of them, could actually save you a lot of time. Uh, and so, uh, you know, like uh, one that comes to mind, for example, is uh, Istio Cuddle Profile Dump, which will dump uh, the conf full configuration for a particular Istio profile that could actually be useful for installation. Uh, maybe you want to, you can use that as a starting point instead of drafting an Istio operator uh, YAML file from scratch. Or uh, another one is the one I mentioned here, the Istio Cuddle X Describe command, which can essentially give the job of uh, sort of inspecting the configuration of your mesh to the Istio CLI and to report on the results as a means of verifying that you've actually done your work correctly. So you don't stop at submitting your custom resource to Kubernetes with the kubectl apply, run the Istio Cuddle describe command, and that will tell you whether routing is configured correctly. Uh, you know, maybe 50% to subset B1 and another 50% to subset B2. So that's, that's another piece of advice I have for you. Know your editor well, know how to work with YAML, you know, indentation can, uh, can really uh, not be your friend. Uh, so uh, again, practice makes perfect. Uh, spending more and more time with these types of resources, knowing how to edit them efficiently, um, using the editor of choice, the one that you're comfortable with, is going to go a long way to, to making your task uh, a pleasure rather than torment. All right, so that's a lot of information I've thrown at you. I hope that you find this useful. I'd like to close by mentioning that KubeCon EU in Paris is upon us. It's just uh, you know uh, maybe a couple of weeks away or, or less. We can actually go and visit the portal. We'll know exactly uh, if you're watching this on March 14th. Uh, yeah, the uh, the conference is March 19th through the 22nd. Uh, you can explore the schedule. And my advice is look on the schedule for resources or resources sessions rather that have to do with learning, right? Learning the different technologies that you're interested in. Uh, you know, I'm specifically preoccupied with service mesh, but you know, anything that uh, is obviously is going to help you uh, make uh, sort of your enterprise environment um, better uh, is is definitely on, on should be on the menu. Uh, I'd like to call out, I was told that there's going to be a cloud native learning lounge uh, at the conference. Uh, you can look for it on the conference schedule. I'm told that there are going to be subject matter, matter experts in different uh, cloud native uh, facets of cloud native or different projects that you can consult with, whether they're, you know, get help with training and certification. So uh, there might be an ask me anything session on the ICA exam. So that's something that's maybe apropos and relevant that you might want to look for and, and, uh, and mark for your schedule. 
All right, and with that, uh, let's conclude this webinar. Uh, I hope that you now have a full of an understanding of the uh, ICA, the Istio Certified Associate exam, and that I've whetted your appetite in terms of making you uh, maybe want to uh, sort of uh, complete your, your training with service meshes and then at some point uh, enroll and take the certification exam. Uh, so thank you for your time and we'll see you maybe in a future webinar. Bye.